Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on AM 1240 WGBB in Freeport, New York, and live streaming on the web at am1240wgbb.com. And I have a guest on the phone with me, a playwright that uh, you've probably heard of because, well, I guess his best-known play was uh, Moon Children, but that, that's going back a few years, but he's had other since, including Spoils of War. He's also written some screenplays to films that you've all seen, and he's having a very, very cool honor, an honor that, let's see, who's, who else has had that honor? Neil Simon, August Wilson, and um, hmm, who, who else of recent note? Have to think about that. But oh, if they haven't got Eugene O'Neill. Eugene, well, okay. If we move backwards, right. uh, well, let's see. London Fontaine weren't playwrights, but we're kind of giving it away at that point. Um, yes, I've got a, a guy who's getting a theater named after him. Oh, and how can I forget Peter Norton, who's having every other theater named after him in New York? But um, I've got Michael Weller on the phone, playwright Michael Weller, and I'm very happy to have him. Welcome, Michael. Well, hiya. Well, first of all, you're involved in so, on some level with the Broken Watch Theater Company, which is the group that is naming the theater after you. A little bit. I'm I'm in, I'm sort of involved with a number of theaters around the city. One of them is the Hypothetical Theater Company. The other is Broken Watch. Mm-hmm. And uh, most um, uh, actively is the Cherry Lane where I'm sort of supervising a mentor program there, where we put together experienced playwrights and young playwrights and do three productions a year um, after the experienced playwrights help them along for eight months or so. And uh, we've had a huge success with that. We've actually had one play move to Broadway a couple seasons ago. Well, what play was that? Uh, it was 16 Wounded by Eliam Cream. Right. And that was one about the, uh, the terrorist yep. who falls in love with the... Uh, That's right. Well, what are your tips for being a playwright? Well, what, are, what are some of the tips that you can give folks who are, or want to do that? Well, hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's <laughs> I've never asked that question. I, I, I'm, I'm so used to doing it now. I don't, I, I, it's more I think I, I couldn't bear the withdrawal uh, symptoms if I <laughs> <laughs> um, I just like it. I like, I love the rehearsal process most of all. I love watching actors say my lines and figure out things that I never considered when I was writing. Um, I like the fact that I control my work when I'm a playwright, unlike when I write movies and TV where the executives control, uh, they hire me and they control what I write. So I like the pride of authorship I can have as a playwright. Um, I like uh, being able to tell my own stories my own way without interference. Um, That's a big kick. And I just like in the end, shaping a story that's riveting from start to finish. When I watch an audience hanging on every word, I, I think, well, this is pretty cool. Well, let me ask, um, first of all, so you mentioned um, Hollywood, because you wrote the, the screenplays for Ragtime, which is an absolutely wonderful movie, and you also did the adaptation for the musical Hair. Right. Um, could you have stayed in the business? Could you have been a working, living, eating Playwright, or did at some point Hollywood have to, does it have to, so you can make a living in this in field? Oh yeah, I think playwriting is not um, is not a, a kind of thing that pays a living anymore. I think the last person I know of who made made a decent living out of it year after year was Neil Simon. Although there are a number of playwrights who kind of piece together enough of a living to to pay the rent, I think. But generally, if you're going to be a playwright, you have to find a day job, and it's you must usually teaching. Um, some people just, I think, have jobs in unrelated fields, and others do screenwriting and, uh, and and television writing to make a living. Did you jump right? I, mean, I wouldn't say jump right in, but um, since I think Moon Children goes back to what 1970? Yeah, 70. Um, hang on, something like that. It was yeah. in London under a different title, like right think, yeah. under cancer, right? I mean, that was, you were pretty young, I assume, at that point. So it was the first job out of, whatever, college, or it's not like you were in other fields and then wrote a play and it got done. Well, not quite. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite like that. Oh, wow. I actually wrote, I wrote, um, I was a composer to begin with. I wrote, um, oh. you know, symphonies and string quartets and things like that. And then I wrote a musical for theater, and I, I wasn't that happy with the text, you know. I thought my music was pretty good, but I didn't think that the play was that great. So I got a book about how to write a play, and I, it advised me to use a, an existing source 
of material, not to try to make up my own story, so I found a book I liked. And I wrote that as a play, figuring I'll write the score when it's all done. And I presented it to this group I always worked with on original musical comedies and stuff at school. And they said I couldn't do the score, they, but, but they accepted the book. And that's the first time I, <laughs> I wrote a play. It was almost by accident, but I... I found I had a real knack for it. It came naturally to me, which music didn't. And it was very successful, so I never looked back. So that, that first play was Moon Children, then? No, no. Oh, no, 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 Lord, no. no, no, no. Moon Children was about my, my 14th play or something. Oh, I'm, forgive me. I didn't, I didn't realize that at all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I knocked around the sort of alternate theater movement in London for a number of years and had a bunch of work done here and there. And uh, I was picked up. At, the, at, a, at a gathering called the National Union of Students uh, Drama um, Festival, where I'd done a one-night play. And the playwright Christopher Hampton saw it and brought me to the attention of the Royal Court Theater, and they commissioned Moon Children. Let me ask, I, even before we uh, got on the air, you, you were a little out of breath because you were bicycling. Right. And, you know, you wrote Moon Children, you, and you uh, worked on hair and stuff. Do you have a certain kind of 1960s leftish sensibility or is that I'm not just reading into that from picking a few pieces from your your day and career oh I see uh, I don't know I think you'd have to ask other people about that I, I don't think of myself consciously as having anything as defined as that I mean I write in a lot of different styles and I come at things from a lot of different angles depending on the material so, I mean, obviously, anybody is a, a product of their time, but I don't think I'm... I mean, I was, my parents were communists, and they met as communists, but I wasn't raised in any particular political climate or religion or anything like that. I was allowed to kind of find my own way. But I would say that... Let's, I, and my wife is a raised Republican oh, God. in a small town <laughs> well, so in was I, California. I so, yeah. you know, we're sort of all over the place at home. I mean, it's a hard question to answer. I don't, I don't know what you would call me. Hi, this is playwright Michael Weller. You're listening to Dave's Gone By on WGBB. Nice to talk to you, Dave. Let's talk a little still more about, like, your influences then. Because, uh, as you said, you hadn't written a play before, and then you got a book out, to, uh, sort of how-to. But then, since you became more of a playwright... Were there others who influenced you? And there can be novelists, too, writers that you respect and admire and learn from. Well, once I decided that I was going to make a go of being a playwright, I was advised by the guy who taught me my one theater course in, in school to go to England and study. So my first influences were all British. Uh, the only American playwright I really, really uh, deeply admired was Albie. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I, when I went to England, the, the playwrights I, I loved there were Wesker, Arnold Wesker was one, Harold Pinter, of course, mm-hmm. um, and uh, David Mercer, and a lot of playwrights that wouldn't be that well known anymore. But um, those were the people I followed and, and, and tried to model myself on. And then while I was living there, suddenly uh, my roommate who read plays for the Royal, Court, uh, for the Royal Shakespeare Company started to send me, uh, you know, show me plays by people like like uh, Lanford Wilson and Sam Shepard and all the emerging, Leonard Melfi, all the emerging writers from the, the you know, East Village. That off off Broadway movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The one that was discovered by a British critic, by the way. You know, hmm. Clive Barnes when he was on the New York Times. And I started reading these plays, and they were the first plays that were like Albie. They, they actually sounded like Americans I knew. And I thought, this is fantastic. There's a way to write American speech that sounds real. And that's what finally turned me on, was, the, was, was reading the American playwrights while I was in England. What do you do if and when you have writer's bro- block on a project? I mean, I've mean, i never had it. Really? No. I mean, it's one thing when you have, like, a deadline and someone's paying you to write a screenplay and boom, you know, you've got to work through it. But even on a play that you have to drum up out of your own head from start to finish and there's not necessarily a theater waiting to have it, even then, you, you just you bang through it? Well, it's not that I bang through it. It's, uh, it, it. it just festers inside until it's ready to be written. And normally I have to have found that last little piece of the puzzle to unlock it. Sometimes it's a, it's a play that I sat on pretty fully formed for a long time 
but I haven't written it because something in me knows better than to try without this last piece of idea falling into place. And then one day I'll just be biking over the bridge or something, and I'll, I'll go, oh, of course, that's what we need. And then I can write the play. The last play that you, you had on Broadway was Spoils of War. Uh, on Broadway, yeah. On Broadway, right. Yeah. What? I had one in the West End a couple of seasons ago. Well, what was that? What, was uh, the, what the Night is For. What the Night is For. What is it about Broadway? Because I'm sure you, like every other playwright, would love to have another play or two on there. But, I mean, what is it about Broadway economics? Is it possible? Is it, is it doable to have a, a new play on Broadway? Well, Proof played there and right. um, Doubt played there. But in other words, when you write a play, when you say the end, you know, when you type 30 or the end or whatever it is at the very bottom of the last page, right. it, what is the first thing in your head? It, it's got to be like, can this, or maybe it isn't. What is the first thing in your head? When I finish the play? Yeah. Um, phew. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and then I send it to a couple of trusted friends to see whether I'm out of my mind or whether this, this actually works. And if they seem, by and large, to um, think it's, it works, I I, um, I send it out. I, yeah, well, I send it to my agent, right, and she course. sends it out, and yeah. we, we see what happens. And sometimes, with my most most recent play, just a few week, actually a few days before I went out west to start rehearsing this Broadway musical, I had a reading of it, and in that very space that's being named for me now, and. Uh, you know, this was a play that I hadn't done much about. I'd written it, and some people liked it, and so forth. But it wasn't really being sent anywhere. I don't know why, but I had a little reading of it put together. And then when it was over, a producer came up, a Broadway guy, and said, I want to do this play. Don't give it to anyone else. Hmm. So that's another way it gets done. Is that so we're going to be seeing that in New York at some point soon? Well, he hopes so, yeah. 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 And when you said you're rehearsing a musical out on the coast, is that Zhivago? Yeah. How's that going? Well, everybody seems very high on it. So, I mean, tell us a little bit more. It's a Broadway musical version of, of Dr. Dr. Zhivago. Zhivago. Yeah, not, not the, the movie, the book. It's about it's based Batman. on the book. We went back to the original material. Mm -hmm. And you're yeah. working with? With uh, Lucy Simon is the, is the uh, composer who did The Secret Garden. Mm -hmm. The lyricists are a team, two people. One is called Michael Corey, and the other is called Amy Powers. And it's... a the first time for both of them, I think, doing a Broadway musical. So uh, that's them. And then the director is Des Mackinoff, who run, who's done a lot of Broadway musicals. So I have to assume that, like the movie, there's an element of spectacle that he would be going for. Yes, but it's very, very different than uh, than the movie. We're, we're trying something that's, I think, much closer in spirit to the book. There's no snow. No snow. Well, <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> well, no, I don't, no. I'm not responsible. I just do the words. Sure. Um, and also, I, uh, from your bio, it mentions that you're concocting a, well, one of the pastiche musical types, or so it sounds like a Fleetwood Mac? Yes, I'm working with Taylor Hackford, the, the, the director, on um, a project based on the two kind of central, uh, you know, um, Records that were made by Fleetwood Mac, the, the one, one, the one called Rumors, and the right, one called and Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. oh, and okay. just about the, the the period of time when they were working on those two. And so that's going to be incorporating their music into. Yes, it's about the it's, it, they use they those two albums together as, the, as the basic. Uh, uh, you know. I assume you have their blessing to do this. Or? Well, I would suggest <laughs> Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of material attracts you? What plays do you find yourself wanting to write? Do you have themes that recur? Or character types? Well, I try not to be too aware of that. I mean, I do know I write in very different veins. I write it, There's one vein of me that writes in a very sort of what would be described as a realistic style, naturalistic style. Um, generally about people in my generation who are who I know at first hand in some way. Mm -hmm. And then there's another vein of writing that I do, which is more heroic. That I wrote a, 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 a play about the Klondike Gold Rush, and that was in a much bigger style. Um, and sometimes I write in a sort of absurd comedy style. I, I wrote about a, a playhouse a little like the public theater in, in that vein. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did the play I just finished a couple of days ago is a sort of comic um, ghost story. In I don't know what style you'd say, but it's not what you normally would associate me with me. But the one that was bought for Broadway is a very naturalistic play. What's the name of that one, by the way? 
Which one, sorry? No, the one that was just bought for... Oh, it's called 50 Words. I'm curious to hear a little bit of, of story telling, if there's stuff to tell. Since you worked on the Ragtime movie, yeah. which, which I, I really, as I mentioned before, quite loved. And, well, the first gen- general question is, how did you take E.L. Doctorow's novel, which is, I won't say sprawling, it's a fairly short novel, but it encompasses a lot of different characters and time frames and stuff, and bring that into a two-and-a-half-hour film? Well, the basic approach was to take um, the story that he had appropriated from, um, from the German novel, no- novella, to, to use as a center of his piece, and to use that as, a, as our central story, which was Colhouse Walker tension and, and suspense are in, of the film and the drama, uh, focus on that story and bring in the others as somewhat subsidiary themes. But the discipline that Foreman and I kind of applied to it was simply that we would kn- we knew that it was going to be episodic and we knew that we had to deal with a number of different uh, plot mm-hmm. threads. So we, we made the, fo- the only one assumption about this, which is that no arc of story that we cut to would end before there was an action within it that was con- that concluded satisfactorily. So it wasn't about nervously cutting from thing to thing, uh, just to keep a lot of balls in the air. It mm. was it was discrete, complete arcs each time we jumped to somebody else. You don't feel jumbled. You feel very. It's, it's a wonderful film. And I have to also. I do have to ask. Did you get to meet Cagney? Oh, I, kn- I got to know him very well. You yeah. got to know him very well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me some Cagney stories. Oh, dear, they're yeah. legion, but the one that... I mean, he was uh, very sick at that. I mean, was, he could barely, at least from the stories I was reading in the paper, no, he it was, was, it was a, an ordeal for him, and then he would do an amazing take and then slump back almost dead. Or is that just ridiculous uh, lies? No, no, that was, that's exaggerated. He, he, he actually had quite, a, quite an amazing amount of stamina for a guy that age. And he, what he had was diabetes, so he was, uh, he was in a wheelchair, but he was very, very alert and very robust and very energetic. Oh. And um, he, uh, in fact, he was rather funny about his acting sometimes because now and then when it was a difficult long speech or something, we had to tack the uh, speeches up in places where he could quickly refer to them if he went dry. And... Uh, after one take, I remember uh, for him to cut, cut, perfect, perfect, Jamesy. And he said, yeah, I read that pretty good. Because <laughs> <laughs> he had literally read it off of a card. But uh, what, what, I, what impressed me about him was, you know, I, at that time, I had something of a reputation in, in, in theater, but none at all in film. I, I, I was sort of dragooned after I'd written Hair. I, I was sort of pulled almost screaming into doing Ragtime because I was busy on some other stuff. So I really wasn't, when, when we were recording Cagney, going up to his farmhouse to sort of say hello and have lunch and see whether he might be interested in the, in the film, I was really a junior character who was along for the ride. So I would sit very quietly and watch the, the Titans kind of talk to each other and take notes and remember as much as I could of what they were saying. But I really didn't, uh, you know, think of myself in that as being there, really. I was more a fly on the wall. But it did come out in one aside at some point when I was um, talking to Cagney that I had, you know, that I did theater. He asked me about that. And um, he asked me, you know, what it was like and tell me some stories about it. And I talked about when I had um, done a play and I, I was wearing a coat that my uncle had given me that was a bombardier's coat from uh, the Second World War mm-hmm. and that it was stolen during rehearsal. And he said, oh, my goodness, that's terrible, that's terrible. But that was all that was said. And then I felt kind of stupid for even <laughs> Bring telling him my, my, my grief. You know. And then about maybe half a year later, um, I got a call from him. That's, and he said, now, Millis tells me you're coming up to look at some land nearby here. Now, I want you to drop by the farmhouse when you're, when you're around and say hello. So I said, well, that's, that's kind of sweet. you know." So I drove up and we sat and had a beer and chatted about this that, and the other and then he as I was leaving he said uh, didn't you forget something and I went no I, d- I don't think so you know he said that's your birthday isn't it and it, in fact it was I remember I, I bought my first piece of land on my birthday but I'd forgotten that because I was so thrilled about the land and I said yeah it's my it's my birthday thanks very much I mean that's amazing that you think of it you know and he said 
no, 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 my pleasure, my pleasure. And I started to go. He said, hey, aren't you forgetting something? I went, what? He said, don't you want your present? And he gave me an absolutely perfect replica of that bombardier's coat that my that wow. was stolen from my you know, He knew exactly what it was. So that's the kind of, you know, amazingly dear guy he was. Very thoughtful, very, um, you know, very down to earth, very caring, really lovely man. Wow, what a wonderful story. Yes. No, that's, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad I asked, you know. Yes. But I want to congratulate you again, first thank of all, on, on getting the theater name. So it's, it's being done on on September 18th. It will now be the Michael Weller Theater at 311 West 43rd Street. Um, and it's are, is only the Broken Watch Company going to be there, or are other companies going to be using the space, you know, or... Well, the Broken Watch has rented the the suite of, of offices where the theater is, mm-hmm. and they're renaming the theater, you know, after me, and right. and they'll do all of their productions there. And I presume, when they're not actively producing a play themselves, they'll be able to rent it out to somebody else. You know? Now, are they obligated to to just do your place? Yes, that's right. that was my condition. <laughs> if you can use my name, but you can only do my place. Actually, one one question did occur to me: uh, if someone commercially were to revive some of your, your older plays. Do you think they would, would hold up? Or sometimes do you look at some of the plays you wrote and they were really amazing for the time, but now you wonder, well, you know, 30, 25 years ago, maybe not. I, I don't know. I've seen, you know, periodically my plays get revived, in, as, as does everybody's plays, right. in these little playhouses here and there. And from time to time I go and see them, and, and, and they're not, you know, often wonderfully done. The actors are... are, are sort of young and right. experienced and all of that. And I think it's just terribly ragged, and I would never write it that way now, and it just feels to me hopelessly amateur and, and, and um, like beginner's work. But people watch it, and they watch it with, at times, a great deal more attention and appreciation than I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, so far, so good. I don't know, you know, really, really, if I... If, if it had to hold up in some larger venue, but the the, the big um, the big I think um, roadblock to a lot of revivals of plays of mine is that I wrote very very big cast plays, so mm-hmm. it's it's um, implausible to do them. It's uh, impractical. I'm sorry to do them on um, on, a, on a stage where the commercial uh, considerations are, are foremost. Well, best of luck on both the films and the theater and Thank your you. new. Theater, your new home, the Michael Weller Theater, and thank you so much for visiting the neighborhood. My pleasure.